I've got a feeling I'm going to be reaching a new audience today, so let me start out with what is Biblical Anarchy? I'm Steve Perry. This is Biblical Anarchy. Biblical Anarchy is my YouTube channel where I take a look at the Bible. It has nothing to do with anarchy like a, as a form of government or anything like that. Rather, we take a look at the Bible and try to use the Bible to understand the Bible, right? What is the Bible trying to say? We don't take what a particular church or religious denomination says or a synagogue or this rabbi says this, therefore the Bible means that. We just try to let the Bible explain the Bible. Um, this has been a long process for me and a large part of the process. And people, listen, s s people are going to disagree with some of my conclusions. I get that. That's why we're anarchy. I can't tell you what to believe. I can just tell you what I found and you can try to make sense of it yourself. So one of the things that's bothered me in this process is the New Testament and their emphasis on the sacrifice of Jesus, right? Sacrifices. When you come back to Tanakh, when you come to the Old Testament, sacrifices are um, have much lower importance. Um, if you read the laws of the sacrifices, they're for unintentional sins. Um, they just don't have the significance they have in the New Testament. That's where the problem started for me. It got worse as I went along because prophets over and over again reject the notions of sacrifices. So how do you make sense of all this in terms of a view of the Bible? As I was going through the sacrifice thing, I ran into some more problems that really started to call parts of the Torah into question for myself. Okay. Now, I'm still a Noahide. I still believe in God, but I want you to follow me through a through a, a, a couple of passages here that led me to Ross Nichols, who wrote this book, the Moses Scroll, that I'm going to be talking about today. Nehemiah eight, starting in verse two. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. <clears throat> Excuse me. How do you read the Torah starting in early morning, even as a sunrise and finish by midday? It just really can't be done. The next problem I encountered was in 1 Samuel 8, starting in verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to Hashem, and Hashem said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Now this is consistent if you read for example, Gideon and Judges says, I won't be your king. God will be your king. There, there are areas where this is consistent with the Torah. But we see that when Samuel does appoint a king in 1 Samuel 10, verse 25, then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid it up before Hashem. Why did it need to be written in a book? If we go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, starting in verse 14, when you come to the land that your Lord, your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord, your God will choose one from among your brothers. You shall set as a king over you. And it starts going through a list of who the king can be and what he can do. Um, why does Samuel have to, did Samuel write this? Did this get added into the Torah? This is a huge inconsistency. In the book of Judges, we get repeatedly, they didn't have a king. Every man did what was right in his own eyes, right? As if it's a bad thing. But then in Samuel, when they want a king, then it's a bad thing to want a king. Yet in Deuteronomy, here we have laws telling us we should have a king and here's what the king can do. Here's who he can be. All of this is just, it's, it's horribly inconsistent. Um, so I started trying to figure out what was going on here. 
back to the sacrifice thing where this tied in is in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. For in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you, right? Now, obviously, you can find in Torah the areas where it just says, hey, just obey God. Here's some commandments. Obey God. Everything will go well. Honor your father and mother that your days will be long in the land, right? You can find those passages. But is it true that he did not command them burnt offerings and sacrifices? And listen, I understand that the Christian argument here is in the day, in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I don't buy it. It seems to me that God here is saying that he did not command burnt offerings and sacrifices. I, I, I'm not like, it's right there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I had all these problems. And in searching for answers to the problems, I stumbled onto Ross Nichols. Ross Nichols is a Hebrew Bible teacher at United Israel World Union. I'm going to put a link down below. Every Saturday morning at 1030, I believe, Central Time, he's got a, um, a Torah lesson, and he's fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, but this book, The Moses Scroll, was right up the alley of what I was looking for. This book is about a scroll that was found by a gentleman by the name of Moses Shapira in the 1800s. Excuse me. He didn't find it. He acquired it. See if any of this sounds familiar. The scroll was found by Bedouin in a cave near the Dead Sea. It was coated with a tar or waxy substance and wrapped in linen and stored in a cave. No, we're not talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls here. <laughs> this is the Moses Shapira scroll. But yes, all of those things that I just said about the Moses Shapira scroll are also true of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found 60 years later. Okay. This Moses Shapira scroll contains portions of Deuteronomy. Let me see. I got it. Deuteronomy um, 1 through 11 and 27 through 31. It contains... Now, Ross does a good job laying out in this book. There are so many references to the Torah and what... It, more specifically to the teaching of Moses or the Torah of Moses. And this scroll lines up perfectly with the internal evidence from the Bible of what the Torah of Moses contained. Um, it lines up fantastically. So for that reason, I happen to... I, I, I don't want to say I agree with Ross because I don't know if he's actually saying this scroll is authentic. He's making an argument for the authenticity, but I don't know if he's drawn a full conclusion. For myself, I have. <laughs> okay? Because my argument, again, this is biblical anarchy, right? I'm not making an argument from an archaeological or historical perspective. I don't have the necessary credentials to do that. But from reading the Bible, everything matches up to where this scroll, and you can get a translation of it here in the book, The Moses Scroll by Ross K. Nichols. This scroll seems to match up perfectly with what I was looking for when I went on the journey on the internet that led me to Ross Nichols. But the problem is the scroll was deemed to be a forgery, a fraud at the time it was discovered. Now remember, this is 60 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Now from a historical standpoint, one of the arguments that Ross makes in here is what an incredible fraud that would be. If Shapira, if, if, if this is just a fraud, if he forged this and his story just happened and the details on it, the, the coated in pitch, the linen, the leather, all these details happen to match the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? That would be one hell of a coincidence that he was able to do that 60 years before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, that doesn't mean it's authentic. It is possible that these are coincidences, right? But notice the argument, right? 
the argument is that we should re-examine this scroll based on the fact that these similarities exist. In other words, if we know that there are authentic scrolls that were stored in this manner and survived for this length of time in the area of the Dead Sea, then it's possible that this too is an authentic scroll. In other words, the argument, the points of the argument, lead to the conclusion of the argument. Why do I point that out? Let me snap the headphones on here real quick. I want to give you the opposing argument because I this is I I to me it's always important to look at both sides of the story. And we have here um Dr. Cargill who I am not a doctor. Okay? I don't mean to denigrate his arguments, but they're pretty bad. Um, he has concluded that the scroll is a forgery. Uh, let me, here it is in his own words. Um, this is his conclusion. So what we have here is yet another unprovenanced object getting run through the media yet again. All we're missing is a documentary called Dismiss Deuteronomy or the first biblical text. The only difference is that we have no object to sell. This is merely an intellectual exercise, one that most scholars have already dismissed, and you should too. The Shapira strips are forgeries. They were when they came to light on the market, and they still are today. So he emphatically states that the Shapira strips are forgeries. They were when they came on the market. They still are today. What? reasons does he make an argument where i can follow the point of his argument to a logical conclusion here's his first reason reason number one they're unprovenance we don't know where they came from and they came to light on the antiquities market okay they're unprovenance we don't know where they came from and they showed up on the antiquities market true as did the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he points this out in his video. But as he points out with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we were able to go back to the caves and find more scrolls, right? So eventually they became providence. But follow the point here. At one point, they had no providence. Then they did. They didn't go from being frauds to being authentic. Obviously, they were authentic all along. The providence helped us to authenticate him. So the argument that he's making here is not a valid argument that these scrolls are a fraud. Rather, it's an argument that we don't have the necessary providence to authenticate them. This is kind of like when you're watching a sporting event and they do instant replay. Sometimes they'll say the ruling on the field has been confirmed or the ruling on the field has been overturned. But other times they will say the ruling on the field stands, meaning we don't have the necessary evidence to make a, a positive conclusion one way or the other. This is the ruling on the field stands. The original ruling was forgery. But instead of telling you, hey, we don't have the providence to overturn that ruling, he's acting as if the lack of providence means that they are a forgery. That is a bad argument. The points of the argument do not lead to the conclusion. It is a non sequitur. Reason number two. And now they're gone, which is reason number two. They're gone. They are no longer extant. They can't be tested. No carbon-14 testing, no patina testing, nothing. Again, there is no way to test, much less prove authenticity. He's right in everything he just said there, but notice what he said. They're a fraud because we have no way to test them. Well, if you have no way to test them, then you have no way to prove that they're a fraud. If the fact that they are gone, that they are no longer extant, if the fact that they are gone proves that they are a fraud, then it stands to reason that if they resurfaced, they would then be legitimate. But that's not the case. As he points out, we would have to then test them, carbon dating, etc. We would have to test these documents, these, these uh, leather strips, to confirm their age, to confirm these things. In other words, 
The fact that they are not here doesn't prove that they are a forgery. It's not even evidence that they are a forgery. The two things are completely unrelated. Once again, this point is a non sequitur. The next reason he gives. Reason number three is the apologetic nature of the find. The apology. The Dead Sea Scrolls are apologetic in nature, and yet they are authentic. If, if I were to follow his point here that a, a, an archaeological find having apologetic value, value means that it's inauthentic, then the entire Bible would be inauthentic. Every manuscript we found is apologetic in nature, right? It, obviously, a document being apologetic in nature doesn't make it a fraud. Now, his fourth point is a valid one. The final reason is one that I'll only mention, and I'll refer you to my colleague Chris Ralston's blog, Ralston Epigraphy, for more information, and I'll put the link in the notes below. The reason is that the script of the Shapira strips shares too many similarities with the forged script of the Moabite clay and stone forgeries that Shapira had sold a few years earlier. Now this argument relates to the conclusion, the points of the argument, that the script on this scroll shares similarities with script on uh, Moabite statues that were proven to be a fraud, that actually has bearing. The points of the argument have bearing on the conclusion of the argument. So I will grant him there. Now, I'm not an expert. I cannot... Um, sit there and, and, and give you any insight on this. I can tell you that there are experts out here on both sides of that issue. Okay. I've, I have done some searching around and found some information that some scholars saying he's right. Other scholars saying he's wrong. Um, you would have to draw your own conclusions on that. I'm not here to tell you what to think, but it bothers me. This is a doctor folks. This is Dr. Cargo. Those are terrible arguments, with the exception of the last one. The first three arguments, are, I, I, I mean, what bothers me even more that on his fourth point, he refers you to an expert who has studied the documents, but yet the major point of his video is that experts shouldn't study the documents because they have no provenance. Um, I'll link his video down below. These are just bad arguments. If you pick up this book here, the Moses Scroll by Ross K. Nichols, there are good arguments in the book why we should revisit the case. A couple of them I laid out for you. The similarity with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it, would, it, it, it would be a hell of a coincidence, folks. If and, and I'm not saying that it isn't, but it would be a hell of a coincidence if um, Moses Shapira were able to come up with this, this way of, you know, all these details of the scroll that are authentic to the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, um, that would be a hell of a coincidence. This book, The Moses Scroll, is available on Amazon. Um, I got the hard copy. I believe it's in paperback as well. It's not an expensive book, and it's a very interesting read, folks. It is a it's a page turner. It's um, it's like a cold case detective work on a, a piece of scroll that is still missing, okay? We do not have the original scroll. That is a big problem. I don't want to say it isn't from an archaeological perspective, right? But from my perspective here at Biblical Anarchy, what I'm trying to do is figure out from the Bible what makes sense and the case he lays out in here, folks. I, I, I was, the verses I read to you early on in his video are tip of the iceberg, okay? One of the great things is is when you get on the right path, how much more information you can find along that lines. And he puts out a lot of it in this book, all the references in Tanakh, in the Old Testament, to the teachings of Moses, how perfectly they match up with the Shapira scroll. Another thing I wanted to address real quick, because in Dr. Cargill's video, he points out when he speaks of the apologetic nature of the scroll, right? He points out the scholars of that day were just discovering that Moses probably didn't write the whole Torah. And so all of a sudden, here comes a copy of Deuteronomy written in the first person by Moses, right? 
if this scroll were able to be authenticated, it would not for a second prove that Moses wrote it in the first person. How can I say that? Because we found copies of the Book of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which purports to be written by Enoch himself in the first person in places. Um, does any scholar therefore conclude that Enoch wrote the Book of Enoch? No. And by the same token, if this scroll were to be authenticated, it would not prove that it was written by Moses. My argument isn't even necessarily that it's written by Moses, rather that it matches up with the teachings that we are told in Tanakh itself that come from the Torah of Moses. This book does a brilliant job of laying out the case. The Moses Scroll, Ross K. Nichols, you can find more videos uh, uh, on the topic on his United Israel World Union YouTube channel. I highly encourage you to check it out. And his teachings on the Pentateuch folks are fantastic. But um, yeah, pick up a copy of the book if you're if you're interested in, in, in the journey that I'm on. This book has been an amazing find. Thank you, uh, Ross Nichols, for this wonderful piece of work. If you enjoy the video, Give it a thumbs up, share it on social media, subscribe to the channel, but whatever you do, don't just sit there, do something.